Hi everyone, welcome to Investing on Purpose. I'm Ryan Daniel Moran. Today I'm gonna to be asking JP about his recent trip to the TED conference. It's something that he always wanted to go to and he came back on fire. He came back ready to change the world and go bigger. And he had all kinds of stories about the people that he met who were changing industries and changing their corner of the world. I think you'll find it very interesting how JP takes some of the insights that he got from the TED conference and how he implemented it into his business and how he is going about being an entrepreneur differently as a result of meeting these movers and shakers. And you'll hear him say how some of the most powerful and influential people in the world are also some of the most humble. I think you'll really enjoy this episode where we talk about the TED conference with JP. Welcome to Investing on Purpose. I'm Ryan Daniel Moran. And I'm JP Newman. And JP just got back from some secret societies. Boy, You're, this is multiple secret societies now, right? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so you just got back from TED. I did. Which is like its own secret society all on its own. Yes. And you were just at that other secret society that you asked me not to name. In Washington, it's so DC. controversial with all the Congress people running around. Yes. So you've been running around with high flyers and big movers and shakers. You're in like all the groups that the online conspiracy theorist forums love to despise. So now I just, I just have to go to the World Economic Forum and then I'll be like a trifecta. You got to hang out with my buddy Klaus Schwab. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> going on your private jet. You know, get angry about climate change. That's yes. what you got to do. So what is it actually like being at TED? You know, Ryan, I want to like, I've been wanting to go to TED for many years. In fact, if you remember the story from one of our episodes, we talked about kind of going from a very dark time and um, my company was actually starting to make money. The crazy thing was my company was starting to make money, but I had all these like things going on. One, I don't know if I was totally ready to make money mentally. It took me a while to catch up and there were some things going on. In the house. And this, this is like a few years into you being yeah. a full on entrepreneur. Yeah, right? yeah. This was like you're probably starting like, to grow, but starting your to life grow. is sort of falling apart at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I remember I actually like closed my office door and they're telling me, like, oh, you just made your first big or you made a big check. And I'd be like crying. I'm like, oh my God, what is wrong with me? That was really odd. And I and I think part of what had happened was, you know, sometimes you you set these goals up of what you think you want and you get it. And I was almost like numb because I couldn't feel like the excitement of the, of the goal quite yet, maybe even scared me. And so one of the things that happened during that time that I really give credit for kind of bringing me out of that, we'll call that funk period, yeah. was this idea. I started reading Peter DeMontis' book. It was actually like the first book I read like that. I think it was Abundance was the book that I'd read. And it gave me the first nugget of this idea of investing on purpose and purpose-driven communities mm. and sustainability. Like this idea that there's tribes of through business that you can actually create like major transformations for humanity. So in other words, you were new in business and starting to see some success, but had no fulfillment. Correct. And then you discovered the work of Peter Diamandis, who was sort of a an insight for you that business could mean something. Yes. That, that what you were doing for work could mean more than you just getting a, a check. Correct. And I think it's important to, to, to note that you came from the film world before you were in real estate. Yeah. Which I think you, you've you said here on the show, you didn't make any money. Uh, you had a, almost a full career there and you didn't make any money. You started all over at 35. Yeah. But it was fun for you. I made money and I spent it. <laughs> okay. So, you, so your net worth. My salary. I spent my salary. Okay. So at 35, you're starting over again. Yeah. And you were kind of leaving something that you found very fun. Yeah. It was your dream. Yeah. And so now you're making money, but there's no joy. Right. And you discover the work of Peter D. Peter D. And yeah. you're doing it, Ted. And then Ted, actually. So Peter D. Montes was the first kernel of this idea of a community, a, ca a capitalistic community for good. That that's actually what was the German. It's something sparked in my soul. It was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I started hearing the TED Talks. And both of those I really credit for my journey into this world of investing on purpose and conscious capitalism. It sparked in me something. It gave me a bigger purpose than just myself or just making money. And it gave me like this idea of like, wow, I can get myself out of the way. I can make money and take care of my huh. family, but there's something bigger here that I can serve. I never knew that part of the story, but it it checks when you look at that timeline yeah. in reverse. It makes sense that you're looking for more purpose and more meaning. And you go and you see these people who are have almost overcorrected in that direction. Yeah. They're so purpose that they forget about the business part of it right. sometimes. Right. And so you always wanted to go in see what that community was like. Yeah, so going to TED last week was a dream come true. It's something I had yearned for for many, many years, and I just hadn't done it. And, you know, many things, they can disappoint you, but I have to say, Ryan, like, 
I figured out oh, maybe it's just a, Ted is this point's a joke, or maybe it's just a big corporate flash flash. A bunch of lefties, lefties hanging lefties out. Hanging room, out. Yeah. But what really shocked me, and I give it to Chris Anderson, the, the founder's credit, was the container that they build there, the people they bring together, the speakers, how they choreograph the whole thing. I found like I'm still like glowing and digesting in it because for the people that were in the room, you know, billionaires, business titans to people that you've never heard of, you know, changing the world in Africa through free eye surgeries, you know, mm. Oxford doctors who just quit and are just, that was like a dinner with a guy who's done 250,000 surgeries with his group and saving vision. And, um, I was just so inspired. You know, we talk about through our episodes about, you know, how, how business can be a, a force for good yeah. and to have that much money in the room and that much power in the room and that much humbleness at the same time. I did not get, no matter whether it was Ray Dalio or whoever you saw there, like I didn't get anybody coming off with like, look at me. It was very much felt like people really being servant leaders and definitely for profit. I mean, the chat GPT, you know, the co-founder of chat GPT. I mean, this was not the, the founder of TikTok, uh, the chairman and CEO of TikTok, which was an interesting talk. So these are not just woo-woo people. These are pe major business titans, you know, changing the world for good. And that is so inspiring. It's what we talk about on all these episodes. But to see it, to see all 2,000 people, they're big, big things. One person you've never heard of, he's created 60, a school for 65,000 kids in Peru because the government can't create mm. quality education. Sal Khan of Khan Academy just partnered with ChatGPT. Everyone in the world, who, every kid who has a problem now has a tutor, an online tutor. It's a, mm. it's a chat GPT avatar. And instead of just giving you the answer, any question you have, you type in the question that you're stuck and chat GPT avatar will just work with you as your own private tutor. Oh, interesting. If you've got a phone. So, I mean, how cool is that? that, that and have all that innovation in one room is very eye-opening. You mentioned Ray Dalio. Was he there? Yes. Okay, so Ray Dalio has kind of, he's obviously already famous as an investor, but he's gotten even more famous recently for basically talking about the changing world order Correct. and how things may be going through an adjustment period over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a room of people who are giving mostly optimistic talks, what does Ray bring to that conversation when he is at least known for being a little bit more doom and gloom? Right well, now? you know, what's interesting. The other person who I heard speak that just as a parallel was Al Gore, like Al Gore being you know, the face of the environment, yet Al Gore, really, if you listen to it, I don't know what the takeaway is for an individual to really change. I, I appreciate his passion, but I don't really know what the takeaway is for an individual uh. to do. But here's what it tells me. Ray, Ray Dalio didn't speak, by the way. Ray Dalio was an attendee. Oh, okay. So what it tells me is as much as he plays gloom and tomb as an actor, he's in a room full of people that are changing the world for the better. And he's obviously an intelligent man, you know? So, so there's got to be something in it for him personally to go take time out of his day and go spend a week in Vancouver, Canada to hear a bunch of people who are generally problem solvers for the world. So when you walk out of that room or when, how long is the conference? Five days. Five days. So you're in this room for five days hearing how people are making an impact in their corner of the world. Yeah. All around the world. So they did a great job. It's not just the U.S. It's really thought leaders and business people from around the world. It was, it was incredible. What do you take from that? Because it's one thing to watch a YouTube video of a TED Talk. It's another to be in that room for five days, yeah. hanging out with all of those people. Yeah. So what is different about the way that you see and think about your business and your impact after spending five days with this group of people? Brian, you know, you realize there's so much goodness in humanity that the news doesn't report. In fact, the way they opened Ted up is like Angus Harvey has um, Future Crunch is the name if anyone's interested. It's a, it's a subscription and it's all the news they're not showing us about how humanity is quickly moving forward. Educational gains, more people are educated. I'm sorry, I have outcomes. to stick this in there because we're recording this the week that the biggest news story is that Tucker Carlson got fired. Right, exactly. Right, which is, exactly. Exa which is exactly zero. It doesn't report any good news. It's just the alternate news for those who don't buy the... CNN stories. Right. And so, so I just find it ironic that you're, you spent some time with Angus. I did. Uh, uh, you, you spent some time with this creator of Future Crunch, which is all the good news in the world. Yeah. And where most of society is focused on the pundits on the news who report well, bad news. And the media. But it's up. alternate bad news. Right. And it's just competing right. bad news. Choose, choose which. <laughs> 
which issue of the bad news you want to be on. Right. It's not it's not a, a choice between good news and bad news. It's a choice between whose bad news do you right. believe? And so you spent this time with the founder of Future Crunch who yeah. just reports on good news happening. And this world. answers the question. I thought it was interesting because the truth, Ryan, is there's a lot of challenges, as you know, with AI and singularity. And you know, even the founder of ChatGPT is like, I am also have sleepless nights about this. It's not like, uh. I mean, there are some real challenges for humanity. We know that there are some challenges. But what I really took away overall was, and I think that's why they opened the conference with Angus, is this idea that um, it's so easy to get caught up on everything. Like we can get taken over the climate, you know, it could be China, it could be Russia, it could be, like there's all these yeah. things that are real threats. And at the same time, there is just a force for good out there of big and small stories you just don't hear mm. of humans really fighting the good fight for humans. And I just think it, when you see people doing it at such scale, like a con, just like literally free tutoring for the world, what's that going to do? Um, it it's inspiring, right? It's inspiring. It, it gives you hope that nothing's been predetermined. The way the world goes is is up for grabs, and everyone's going to vote. So if you, if if you just follow the Ready Player One formula that this is going to go dystopian, it might, it might. Like there's no guarantees it won't. But the empowerment that I got from it, Ryan, is like my company Thrive. Providing housing, you know, going harder at the nonprofit and really building, you know, free programs for residents and showing that decency and that connection, that's fighting the good fight at any level. I don't care. And we've talked about this, right? Like whatever you're doing out there as a business, whether it's small scale or big scale, then you're then you get to participate in your voting on an outcome. Yeah. And everybody matters. And I think the excitement and the enthusiasm you're seeing for me is it gives you a real versus just watching a speaker. When you're immersed in 84 speeches or how many speeches that I saw, and you see these individuals and you're talking to people on a bus that you would never usually talk it's to. It's like a good news bath. It's a good news bath. You're, you're, with, like you're just surrounded by all these movers and With reality of real problems. Yeah. But people tell me how to solve the real problems. And and also something we're human beings. We don't know. We don't know if it's going to end, you know, how it's going to, you know, how this looks in 20 years from now. But but why not vote and fight the good fight? You know, it's I, I enjoy these conversations with you because, y you know, I, I I spend a decent amount of time in my mind debating conspiracy theorists. And I do this because I used to be one, right? right and, yeah. I, and, I, and, I, and I know what it costs me to believe all that negativity. And it's interesting hearing you talk about this because you're literally in the rooms with the people that the internet has conspiracy theories about right and you're saying that they're human beings who are thinking about how they solve problems i mean i was telling you ryan you know with crispr that the the you know yeah jenna dowda Je, uh, genuine data or jenna dowda the doctor who created crispr which is the gene editing tool yeah they just for the first time cured an incur incurable leukemia that just happened in the last couple months That's i like amazing. like like things that are told we can't cure or can't fix we're fixing I told Esther that this morning. Oh, yeah. I was taking her to school because her grandfather, who she never met, died of leukemia. Mm -hmm. And the idea that someone else out there was cured of an incurable form of that yeah. is really cool yeah. to everybody, including my my seven year old daughter. Yeah. You know, your your birthday was just a few days ago. Yeah. And at your birthday party, you showed the opening talk from mm -hmm. Ted mm -hmm. about all the good news that's happening in the world. And this inspired me to go back and look at trends in the world. Because one point that I heard, what's his name, Angus? Angus Harvey. Harvey, okay, so Angus Harvey, I heard him say that basically we're bombarded with all of this daily bad news, which is this person said this about this person, and this person's report, it's just all gossip. Right. But the trend of the world is very good. Positive. If, if you look at it from a year perspective, two years, 10 years. So I went back and I said, okay, what is, let's actually just look at the history of capitalism. How new is capitalism? Yeah. And the wealth of nations, which is basically, you know, Adam Smith's Bible for capitalism, the, the opening move for capitalism was published in 1776. Right. And, you know, they don't have the internet back then. So things moved a lot slower. So yeah. you could see that that would start getting adopted in about 1800. Like it would start to influence people 1800, early 1800s. And it, from 1800 
to today, you have an 83% reduction in extreme poverty. Yeah. Just from 200 years of being inspired by free markets, you have almost a complete eradication of slavery. Yeah. Of of what we refer to as slavery is pretty much gone in yeah. 200 years. We live three times as long. Isn't that amazing? To think, and when you think about that kind of a trend, that's only 200 years. Both of us are going to be on this planet for another at least 50. Yes. So if you think about it from that lens, I got really excited when I went home and did my homework after watching that talk. Yeah. Because I started to see that there's a much bigger trend that is happening faster and faster. And it made me less afraid of things like AI because it just showed me that there's a trend happening that is beyond me that I'm participating in. You are. And it made me want to go harder and faster in creating something meaningful for the world. You know, right in my experience lately, and part of this actually, I loved our conversation with Jeremy Surya. And actually, I feel like I'm thinking differently even from our podcast with, with Jeremy at the time. But I, I'm noticing lately that after going to a lot of the conferences, you know, I've now been with top speakers of the house, you know, senators, top, I mean, really between the conferences, you know, I'm, to, I'm flying out tomorrow to Egypt for another interesting conference. <laughs> and the thing I really get most from it though is that when you embrace your your power that each one of us has as a human being as a as a capitalist and you actually embrace that optimism and you embrace that you matter that your vote matters through your product and service you matter as a human being but when you radiate that energy out there versus the fearful energy i can, i got a phone call to one example i'm now getting call after call people are like can you help me do this can you help me do that the energy inspires other people it's almost like singing. It, it it wakes other people's souls up to want to do the same thing. Mm. So it's, I guess it's like it's maybe it's the law of attraction or something like that. Woo woo. But like, I just noticed lately that I language differently now. I I since it, Ted, these last couple of months of conferences have just been downloaded with all these people and kind of putting it together. It's not the words that I say. I just know my energy is changing right now. It's like because I kind of get the game. I yeah, kind of I get, get what's going on. I'm on, I feel like I am on the cutting edge of what's going on. I don't know the outcome, but I know the game. Hmm. And I get to participate in the game. How I get to participate in the conversations. The game is our future, our, our kids' future, our future for our businesses, uh. for our families, for the next generation. And that I get to participate in that. This this moment with you, Ryan, like, you know, if this wakes up one person or 10,000 people, we're participating in waking people up to humanity that we are a powerful species. We, what we create, like the, the things I saw at Ted, some of the demonstrations of like the next iPhone. Um, one woman decided she's an artist. She basically took the patterns of 10, a flock of 10,000 birds, and she's been able to program an AI drones with lights to literally replicate all those birds' movements. And she's putting them over a lake in a Burning Man. 10,000 drones in harmony with these beautiful lights that flash in a, they flash at a speed where it connects to the human heart. So it feels more like a natural bird than like, than like robots. So again, (laughs) are they drones attacking us, which could be, or is it art and is it beautiful art and hearing music that's been co written between AI and human beings and and the beauty between that when it's really being embraced and not, you know, again, it can go, I'm not saying it can't go bad. Like we really have real ethical issues we need to deal with. This isn't like, knocking out not thinking about the bad it's just it's just a different mindset i hope this isn't too far into the woo but i have been thinking about what determines whether or not we see this as a positive thing or a negative thing right what 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 leads to abundance and what leads to destruction and so far the thing that i have isolated is when we feel separated from the trend of humanity from technology, from like things progressing. When we feel separated from that, we view it as a threat. Mm -hmm. And when you feel like something is a threat, you start going into defense mode. You start trying to protect. You start seeing other people as the enemy trying to get you. But if you see it all as being this unfolding that you're part of, then you're just participating in the abundance. There's just, there's nothing to freak out about. It's all unfolding for you and with you and through you. Yeah. What is your take on that? Yeah, I think that's that's right. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. It's kind of like 
you radiate whatever transmission you're bringing. You, if, if it's fear, you're just going to radiate that out. If you're bringing that in. And I think it's important, right? I'm realizing as I'm talking to you that, um, it's easy to say, oh, well, JP went to these conferences and, you know, like, but what about everyone else out here? You know, I don't have that abundance right now. I don't have money. It's great for you to say. And that's real. So like, like, yeah, it is I know real. when I was in scarcity and I could barely pay my, you know, for my kids' diapers, that, I, that's you, pretty stressful. Even I mean, though I'm is. not in scarcity, I still have moments. Like right. That. I still, have, I, you're the person I call when I'm having those yeah. moments. Yeah. Right. So, so it's really real that when we're in scarcity or fear, and I think having like, sympathy that the world is scary or can feel scary like yeah. that, like like let's not deny that that can be real and at the same time you know what are you putting in your brain what's your input and what's your output so it, your input's going to decide on your output so if you look you can watch a ted talk for free you can read a book for eight dollars you know you can watch all these different things about what's happening like a lot of what i did was the expensive way to do it but there's ways to do this with the internet now, like literally TED Talks are free. So There's I'm gonna, so much I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw a wrench in this argument. Please. Right. And and the reason is because I know for myself, and I'm thinking of a particular person in my life, that you could not have them sit down and read enough books and watch enough positive things that would change their view on okay. it. Right. And when I know when I'm in a negative place, yeah. it's the same thing. I'm gonna interpret whatever since you mentioned like frequency and what you're vibrating at, if I'm in a negative place like that, I'm going to interpret everything as the same way. Right. But I never feel that way when I feel plugged in with others and when I'm serving other people. Correct. I never yeah. feel like I'm in a bad place. I was telling Alex. I think that's here, right. I was telling Alex. I realize now that every time I'm depressed and every time I'm anxious, I'm thinking about myself and yeah. what I can get. Yeah. And, and the minute I switch over into thinking about my neighbor, my kids, my customers, and just thinking about what I can do for them, my team members, if I just stop and think about like, what can I do for Alex? What can I do for Stan? What can I do? The minute I have that switch, all of a sudden a positive momentum starts to build. Yeah. You know, this this week is our annual conference and I'm freaking out about a bunch of last minute details. A speaker canceled last minute and haven't had the time or the space to work on the speech as much as I want. I know what it's going to be, but I need to outline. Like I got all these things flying around in my brain. And when I'm thinking about, oh, is this going to make me look bad? Like, or... Are people going to buy things? Like when I'm thinking about me, I'm stressed and yeah. I'm angry. But the minute I think about, I'm just going to show up and give these people an amazing time. The speech is going to be great. Right. This this slot that got everything is going to work out just fine. Yeah. And so I have been thinking a lot about how we not just bathe somebody in positive good news, but how do you get them to think the minute get that to make that switch of thinking about other people? I right. think one of the most powerful things that you said about being in this room at TED is that everybody is thinking about what they're creating and what they're doing for humanity. Right. How do you, how do you not feel positive about the world? You, you, you're like bouncing. And I think if we could, I think this is a hack for happiness. I think you just, I agree. I think when you can get out of your own way and actually your default starts to be like, how do I serve something bigger than me? And that just becomes, I even a thought. It just becomes who you are. That's the hack for happiness. So for most people, let's we're wired for that. That's let's wrap on how you do that. Yeah. I mean, you, you have a couple decades more of life experience than me. Yeah. How do you, how do you, well, again, <laughs> how, do you do, how do you hack that? <laughs> I, I, I think at a certain point, first of all, if you go back to Maslow's hierarchy, I think you have to get out of like survival mode. And so if you can't pay your bills, if you're, if you're sick, it's harder. It's not impossible, but it's harder. It's just harder. Yeah. It's just harder. But if you can get to the point of like, I think, what do they say? Whatever. It's, let's call it close to 75,000, 50 to 75,000, where, you know, you can pay your rent, you've got food, you've got basic things. There's always more money. So you're going to be always someone richer than us. So at a certain point, you have to say it's enough. And then I think once you're kind of, if you're lucky enough to not be in some kind of scarcity like or, or crisis, I think it becomes a mindset. It becomes a habitual thinking. I think you train your mind. And you think it's practice? I do think it's practice. I, I think it's just like working out, right? I'm like, I didn't start this way. I started from scarcity, fear, lack, limitation. I did not like, I'm not like, I didn't grow up like this. You know, I've always been very youthfully energetic, but believe me, I've had my dark times. I do think it was a practice. I think, I think again, I think the the story I told earlier about Diamantis or the TED Talks and listening to Tony Robbins, it sparks something like it's it's something that I yearn for because I was not in that place. Mm. And I started listening more and I started reading books and I'm like, there's gotta be a community out there. And I started exploring, like I started asking questions like, where can I find, because I knew nobody who would think this way. I, yeah. I didn't have anyone in my life, Ryan, 
who thought about abundance or optimism or how do we serve. That was not my framework at all. But then, so all I had was a book, but I didn't have anyone I actually knew who actually lived this way. So it became a journey of like, whatever they're talking about, all I know is it's bringing me energy and it's kind of getting me out of a funk. And I'm just going to follow that energy. And it, like one thing leads to the next. That, thing. that right there. So you, you had, you had a desire for something else. I was right? miserable. I was miserable. Right. You, yeah. But out of that misery is a desire for there to be more contribution. And you're sort of just looking for whatever matches that. I am. And then, because and then you started me, following yeah. that energy. That, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Just following the energy that feels in alignment with that desire. And then all of a sudden it, it builds on. Like, then you bump into someone who tells you, hey, there's a conference. There's actually a conference of people. Uh, and that's these are leaders that are, that are, you know, and that became Summit actually, mm. uh, my first trip on the boat. And so it was like one thing led me to the next thing and it led me to the next thing that led me to the next thing. Um, and it's been this beautiful journey, but you're right. The journey came from a deep desire and intention. Well, that's beautiful, JP. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank it, you. It, it is really good to know that not only are there people out there who are focused on creating something good, but that they're all hanging out. They are. <laughs> right. Because, because the, because the people who are yelling at their screens, who are angry about the world and fearful about the world are the loudest, but they're not showing up to go make a difference for the world. Yeah. And so it reinforces a belief that I have that, that good is more powerful and that there's very little we can do to resist the progress of the world. And somehow it's all going to work out just fine. Whatever it is, it's going to work out. The other thing, Ryan, is I think when you're with people that I really learned this at TED after all these conferences, when you're really with people that genuinely, authentically are coming from a place of servant leadership, the humbleness is there. Like I've been mm -hmm. to so many conferences that are pseudo community conferences and they're still really in their ego. They're, you know, yeah. they're, they're still shining. I, when you see people that are really in their purpose, they don't have an ego because it's not about them anymore. Because some people are doing good just so they look good or that's a good article in yeah. Forbes or whatever. And so to be around this power of people and seeing how humble, I mean, it was actually a, such a grounded, almost tribal, humble, no names, no security details, mm. just people. And everyone was accessible. It gave me a little bit of guidance to like who is really playing the game the way you and I are talking about it. That's beautiful. Thanks yeah. for sharing, JP. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.